What's going on? It's Ed here from Clicks Geek, and I'm here with Solhel Khan. Solhel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So, very excited to, to have you here today. Uh, I first saw you interviewed on uh, Stuart Trier's podcast, uh, Marketing Cheat Guides, a couple of years ago. Um, after cool. seeing that, I went out and purchased your book, The Great Thank Marketing you. and Joint Ventures uh, Guide. Excellent book. Really enjoyed this. Cool. Talk to me, talk to me about this book. How did this, how did this all come about? Well, this is, this is a really interesting story. I used to be part of a, um, a 25K mastermind and every year they do like a, um, a mastermind cruise. And uh, one particular year they had, um, they had two uh, keynote speakers. One was Michael Gerber from the EMIF and one was uh, J. Corey Levinson uh, from Gorilla Marketing. And um, as you know, I'm a really good connector and I, I've learned a lot over the years of how to connect with thought leaders and how to connect with sort of millionaires and billionaires being a, J, uh, a joint venture broker. Um, and uh, we were told specifically that basically uh, when we're on the cruise, um, uh, not to disturb the, the keynote speakers when they're having uh, dinner with their families, in the VIP area. And um, during the day, um, I, 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 met, I met with J. Corey Levinson. He was on his own. He was sitting in the lounge uh, in the lobby. And um, I just asked him a simple question. I said, look, um, is it possible for us to sit down for five, 10 minutes when you have some time? I'd love to just, uh, you know, um, uh, have a conversation with you. And uh, I left it at that. A lot of people on the cruise were like groupies and they were always following him around everywhere. And I didn't really want to be a groupie. So, and I didn't want to sound like I was very really desperate to meet this guy. Um, Michael Gerber, on the other hand, was very hard to interact with. He had his uh, he had his um, uh, uh, entourage there. He would come in and speak and then he'd disappear. And that's it. He, would inter he wouldn't interact much with us. But uh, Jay Quiet Levinson interacted with everyone on the cruise. So later that evening, uh, when I walked into the dinner hall, and obviously we were told specifically not to disturb the, the, the VIPs in the, in the VIP area. J uh, Jay called me over and he said, so hell, come, and, uh, come over here and let me introduce you to my family. And I ended up sitting with him and his family having dinner that night. And nice. that's, when I, we had the that's when we had the conversation about what I do, about what he does. And uh, the idea for the book, the book was basically, Jay Abraham is, is, is one of my mentors. And um, at the time I was um, putting the book together, I reached out to Jay, but Jay was, um, had another book coming out at that point and he, he, he couldn't focus his time and energy. So I said to the other Jay, uh, the Grilla Marketing Jay, that look, you know, I've, I'm, I'm looking for someone to partner up with this on this book. And he said, look, send me the, the manuscript and I'll have a look at it. So I sent him the manuscript and he really, really liked it. And he said, look, let's do this. Why don't we just partner on it? I do the guerrilla marketing side. You do the joint venture side. And that's how that partnership came. And that book for me has been phenomenal. I mean, um, also in 2014, uh, Jay passed away. So um, he was one of my mentors also. And um, the book basically just, just, just hung about. Their family didn't want it published because uh, of his legacy. It was the last book that he wrote. And it was the, the last interview that I did with him is actually in that book. And then it took me a year to convince his family to release the book and get it published. So it was finally published. And the book's been phenomenal. It's been responsible for millions of dollars of, uh, of business for me. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate with that. That's awesome. This, uh, you know, getting that story, this is like the epitome of a joint venture. Yeah. Why, why don't you walk me through um, what is a joint venture? For those that don't understand what it is, what is it? And then what's the difference between a joint venture and a strategic alliance? Great question. So basically, um, uh, when I talk about joint ventures, the way I explain it is, let's say you have a bathroom tile manufacturer and a bathroom suite manufacturer. Now, they both, um, they both target the same audience. So they have basically what, what I call complementary resources, which is their customer base. But most of the times, these two companies see each other as competitors. That's one of the main issues of, of them getting together to form a, a joint venture partnership. And when you have more than two people in the entity, the third person is known as myself as a joint venture broker. And what we do is we put these companies together and we basically form joint venture partnerships as middlemen and basically help to make sure that the joint venture partnerships or any joint ventures that are put together, we manage that from A to Z. Um, a strategic alliance is used more in the corporate sector. So in terms of putting together a strategic alliance, what some people perceive from that is when it's more of, a, of, of an entity based in two companies merging, for example. So a joint venture partnership is something that where, you're ha where you have a long-term relationship, 
but it's two separate entities. Uh, strategic alliances are more in, in seen in the corporate space where two companies merge or they form a, uh, a an exclusive company uh, with two entities put together. So that's re really what a strategic alliance is. Got it. Okay. Flesh out a little bit more what a joint venture is. Walk to walk me through um, how it would be implemented. What would be the purpose of it? Why do people do joint ventures? That kind of stuff. That's a very good question. Um, I think one of the main um, uh, uh, benefits of doing joint ventures is there's no upfront marketing costs. So, for example, one of the things that I do when I speak to the clients is my pitch is, look, what if I can show you how to um, create an additional revenue stream without, uh, without increasing your overheads? So basically what I say to them is if you're spending money right now on, let's say, pay-per-click marketing, whether it's Facebook ads or Google ads, I will show you a way to bring that, that, that ad spend down dramatically by doing more joint venture partnerships. Because when you do joint venture partnerships, there is no uh, fundamentally no cost up front to get another company to promote your product or service to their existing customers. So that's basically the power of how um, uh, strong and how powerful joint ventures really are. Got it. So it's, it's, it's about finding people that already have affinity with the audience that you're targeting and getting other Correct. people to promote your product in front of them, obviously for some sort of an exchange. What, what would Correct. that exchange look like on the back end? It really depends. What I, I normally uh, recommend is when uh, I'm going into a joint venture partnership or if I've got a client that wants to do a joint venture partnership, is you always give the majority percentage to the JV partner. Uh, this, way, uh, this way you get uh, a more dynamic uh, joint venture relationship. The thing is, when you're approaching joint venture partners, they'll always ask that question, what's in it for us? Why should we give you access to our customer base? Okay, and what's in it for us? So I always say, people will say, look, let's do a 50-50 split. A 50-50 split is, is fair, but then I would always say, go a, bit more, uh, uh, go a bit more higher and go a bit more further by offering them a, a 60 uh, as opposed to a 50. Because what happens is the relationship becomes stronger and then you've got more of a guarantee of the joint venture actually going through. A lot of people complain to me that I've tried joint ventures in the past, but it didn't really go anywhere. That's a lot to do in managing the joint venture. And also the joint venture partner has to, have a, has to really uh, have a, a huge um, uh, incentive to why they should be promoting your product or service to their customers. So that's what I recommend percentage wise. Got it. Okay. So 50, 50, 60, 40, um, a person that's out there, let's say installing roofs may shit their pants at the, the idea of giving a 60, 40 split to somebody. Is that on net profit? Is that on gross? How do you come up with what the, the split? You can do it. You, you can do it. You can do it on both. Um, right. I tend to do it on sales, but you can do it on profit also. If you've got like a roofer, for example, that has all uh, material costs, for example, then yes, I would recommend doing that on a profit basis. So whatever profit comes out from the job, for example, yep. that is split on a 60, 40 basis. So at least the roofer's uh, addition, his costs are covered um, in that, uh, in that deal. Got it. Okay. Let's stick with the, the theme of a roofer. Who would be a, uh, who would be an example business you'd want to reach out to to set up a joint venture with the roofing business that wanted to do more residential installations? That's a great question. Uh, any, anyone in the construction industry, to be honest with you, uh, anyone that has um, access to customers who want to purchase um, that service. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is the ideal way to uh, identify the, uh, the, the, the exact potential joint venture partners. So whatever the roofer uh, has in place right now in terms of the customers um, are, are buying that service, he has to think about what do those customers purchase before they come to the roofer? And then what do those customers purchase after they've gone to the roofer? So those two elements are your ideal JV partners. So anyone that's in that transaction um, a string, okay, where the roofer, where they're, where they're uh, accessing the services of the roofer, what do they purchase before and what do they purchase after? That's how you determine your ideal joint venture partner. Got it. Okay. Um, in, in Jay Abraham's book, uh, he uses the, the phrase host beneficiary relationship to describe uh, a joint venture. Can you go into, uh, you know, uh, just get, flesh that out a little bit for me, give me a little context around um, that. That's great. So, that's great. So the host is always the person that's basically uh, basically doing the, 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 the distribution or the promotion. So the host is the person that basically takes care of the marketing and the okay. beneficiary is the person that provides that product or service. Got it. And then cuts them in on the revenue on the back end. 
Correct, yeah. Um, when you say provides the marketing, uh, and you when you approach a JV, you want to make this as easy for the host as humanly possible. Um, are you, as a beneficiary, going to be taking on the cost of the marketing, supplying um, you know a direct mail house if it's going to be direct mail, or are you footing the cost for the marketing? How, how does that work so that it, it remains painless for the host? Great question. So I'll give you an example of an actual real life case study of uh, a joint venture that I did um, many years ago. So I used to run a, uh, a online training company and we used to provide computer training courses, which were PDF downloads. Uh, I approached another company, which was in the IT recruitment sector. They had over 100,000 customers on their, 100,000 IT professionals on their database. And my proposition was, look, I'm going to help you create an additional revenue stream. And also, uh, I'm going to show you how to do that without increasing your overhead. So what are you currently doing right now to market or promote to those 100,000 on your, on your list? And they were actually sending out a newsletter out every two weeks. So there's already, um, there is already a fixed uh, marketing cost that they already have. All they did was insert my banners, for example, or my marketing material into those newsletters that were going out uh, every two weeks. So most of the joint ventures that I do, I try and find, um, uh, you know, what that company is already doing right now in terms of marketing wise. Now, if there is an avenue where they are not doing any sort of marketing or promotion, then I would, I would always say, okay, I can provide the copy. When it comes to marketing costs, it's something that you can do. Uh, depending on the deal, you can share the marketing costs. If it involves you uh, purchasing um, a more, um, elements and services outside of what they're existing with the marketing, then uh, then there is a chance that you will go into a 50-50 arrangement to uh, to provide that cost. However, out of I'd say 90% of joint ventures that I've been involved in, um, there's never been that element because the companies that I approach are already doing some sort of existing marketing already to their customer base. So I always try and look for that element because my proposition is always I'll show you how to make more money right, uh, without increasing your overhead costs because you're already marketing to those existing customers. Got it. So if they're already marketing, it's, it's slipping in a banner into a digital newsletter, it's adding a buck slip into a piece of direct mail that's going out, that kind of method? Correct. Right. Yeah, okay. it's, just, it's just an addition to what they're already doing. Got it. Okay. Is there, um, is there a size of business that works um, like a sweet spot for joint ventures? Or can this work? For yeah, uh, for me, yeah, sure. For me, uh, when I was doing a lot of consulting in the space, uh, joint venture consulting, my sweet spot was uh, companies um, a minimum of 15, 20 million turnover when I was doing uh, my consulting. My consulting <clears throat> I was doing back then was, was $30,000 a day consulting. Now, sweet spot in terms of looking at a company, then you've got to look at a company that's doing at least a $500,000 turnover, at least $500,000 turnover. You could do it with a smaller company, but I'd say in terms of um, a sales, here's how it works. You are guaranteed to make money from a joint venture if that company that you joint venture with is already making money. The more money that company is making, the more money you will make by partnering with that company. So that's, that seems to be the, the, the better conversion uh, that I've seen doing joint ventures. Got it. How do you recommend a, uh, a local business track all of this? Oh, that's very simple. Uh, there's two ways you can do it. Um, one is in all our agreements uh, or any agreements that you are put together and make sure you do a joint venture partnership with an agreement. I've done handshake agreements in the past and uh, I don't do them anymore. I, I make sure everything's done using an agreement. In your agreement, you must put some clauses in there that you have access to things like their shipping records and their sales records. If it's a larger deal you're doing, then you'll use something like an escrow account, which really, really helps. That way you can track sales and you can track what's going on internally. Uh, number two, if you're, uh, if you're using a company that will be doing the sales online, then you just basically use an affiliate program. So there's many affiliate programs that you can use and that affiliate program will basically track any sales that come in, if they use an online uh, merchant service, most companies nowadays do. Now, if it's, if it's a smaller company and they're using uh, and they're not tracking using uh, an online facility, then it's a matter of uh, having an agreement in place that you have access to those receipts. However, a lot of the companies you see nowadays, even small businesses, they have these handheld um, uh, terminals. Those terminals are linked to things like PayPal, Stripe. So they're actually linked to an online account. So uh, you, can, um, you can actually get that online account 
and you can connect that to an affiliate program that tracks those sales. So nowadays it's very easy compared to how it was back like 10, 15 years ago when we had to do things manually. So it's much easier now. Cool. What are, um, what are some examples of, of joint ventures that you've seen be really successful? I think some of the most successful joint ventures are always when people always say, where do I start? Okay. Um, I have a product or a service. I need to go and find joint venture partners. The most successful joint, joint ventures that I've done and my students have done and clients have done and people I've seen done is when you have actually control of the distribution, when you've found someone that will allow you to promote to their list. So I always say you have two types of joint ventures, product side and list side. What you want is the list side, which is the customer side. You want to go and find companies, uh, databases, lists that will allow you to uh, market to them and then it's a matter of just going out and finding the right product to put through that distribution channel. So I always say the money is in the distribution. If you can find a distribution channel, that is the, uh, that is the best kind of joint venture that you'll ever do. Got it. What are some, um, some joint venture red flags, things that people should be looking out for, things to avoid, stuff like that? That's a great question. Uh, so, uh, it, it, so at the beginning, you've got to do your due diligence, okay? I would not walk into a, a joint venture um, uh, with a partner that number one has no testimonials okay number one cannot provide um, a, any proof uh, of what they do and what they say also nowadays we have social media so it makes it much much more easier but I mean a lot of red flags when it comes to joint ventures are people that are very uh, that don't provide that information so we basically make sure we do a due diligence to start off with always work with a partner that has a good reputation in the marketplace because it's your reputation on the line as well because they're promoting your product, okay, and vice versa. So I would always look for testimonials, get them to provide you with testimonials, and you can even go one step further by saying, look, is it possible for us to talk to some of your customers or talk to some of your clients? So um, those are the things that I would really, really watch for. A lot of people yeah. always say, what happens if I get cut out of a deal, right? So another red flag is, you know, if you're working with a joint venture partner, uh, which has happened in the past with a lot of people I know that they're promoted or, or they've, they've gone out their way to a former joint venture partnership, but nothing's come through in terms of, in terms of money wise, even when they have agreements in place. So I think, you know, you've got to do due diligence and there's a lot of things online you can do. There's a website called socialmention.com. Uh, there's Google alerts. So a lot of things that you can go and search online for keywords before you go into a partnership with a company. And nowadays we've got so many resources that you can actually research um, on a client or on a company that you want to JV with before you actually go into a joint venture partnership. Got it. Okay. Um, walk me through, uh, let's say we are a, um, let's say we're a local accountant that wants to do more business. Brilliant. Walk me through um, how you would go, if you're the actual owner of the business. What would, okay. So what first, of, first, of, first of all, Sure. First of all, I, I am an ex accountant myself. Uh, there we go. Accountants are the, yeah, okay. accountants <laughs> are the hardest. Accountants are the hardest people to approach for joint venture partnerships because they're very guarded with their clients. However, an accountant, okay, his proposition would be: Look, I'm here to not only do your taxes and your accounts. I want to help you guys grow because the more you grow as businesses then basically the more money you're going to spend with me. So it's in, it's in my interest to, uh, to help you guys grow. So the accountant is in, a, in, a, in an amazing position. Uh, and one thing he could do, uh, which, is, which would not even require him to go outside of his scope, is basically do joint ventures between his clients. So all he has to do is identify what each client wants, what are, what are their basically requirements, uh, what do they need to make more money and grow, and it's simple for the accountant. He can basically train himself up to basically create joint venture partnerships between his own clients. So I think accountants are in a win-win situation. But like I say, they're sometimes the hardest to crack uh, when you're approaching them for joint venture partnerships. Sure. Is that because they're very analytical in nature and want to know exactly what the outcome is going to look like? Very, gu very guarded, require right. a lot of in-depth information, don't believe everything they hear, um, very old school as well mm -hmm. because they're set in their ways but once you get through to an accountant and you can uh, convince them that this will be a benefit to their um, uh, clients because if their clients grow they'll spend more money uh, with the accountant then it's a win-win sure um so let's go with a different example not an accountant then let's go with uh 
let's say um, let's say you're a local limo business, you know, that has truck okay. magazines and sedans for the airport and that kind of stuff. Um, if I'm the owner of that business, like what would be the process? Like who would I reach out to or like what would my, my thought process be to get this thing rolling? Good question. The first thing I would do if I was a limo owner is I would survey my existing customers to find out what else they, they, they purchase or what else other interests they have within that industry. Because that's, that's, that those are people who are paying for a service and they want to be, they want to be seen. So for a, a, a company like a limo company, partnering with like jewelers, for example, luxury watch shops, for example, high-end fashion, for example. So that is where they could basically get, get customers and clients. And what I would do with a limo uh, driver is I would probably offer a coupon and I would offer an, I'd make an offer where if someone makes a purchase in a store or, or in a luxury store for more than, let's say, $100, they get a coupon for 50% off a, a limo ride. So that is how um, uh, you can create easy joint venture partnerships between uh, someone like a limo company and, uh, and, these, and these luxury stores. Got it. So in that scenario where they're offering the coupon based JV, is it that um, you make this product, you make this purchase and an added benefit of this purchase is you get a, a coupon to this service? In that scenario, is there a kickback to the jeweler or is that the kickback? The, the there could be, but your proposition would be, look, let me show you how to increase your average, average, um, you know, average basket value. So if I give you a coupon that allows someone to have, uh, uh, you know, a half price limo ride, attach mm -hmm. that to a higher, higher basket value, and then you can basically sell at a higher basket value and just provide that coupon. So nice. that is one of the, that's the proposition. Yeah. Right. How, how is it, how important is it to teach members of the joint venture, the power of client lifetime value, as opposed to that, or initial upfront purchase? Oh, without a doubt, because I'll tell you what, there's a massive gap right now in um, companies because we all spend so much money on lead gen. We throw money at lead gen, but we don't look after our existing customers. And you hit the nail on the head. It's about lifetime, uh, uh, the lifetime customer value of that customer. That customer will be so is loyal to you and will spend and spend and you and just because you make one sale from that customer that is not your uh, ultimate sale your ultimate sale and goal is to have them spend with you uh, for the lifetime period so that is a great question and that's what we should be focusing on is providing more products and services to our existing customers that we can't fulfill through doing joint venture partnerships with other suppliers that's the big gap i see in the market right now got it do you find um do you find the, the, the coupon approach or gift card approach is a more powerful approach than that's just a straight up offer? What, what do you find works better? It is because it's a tangible thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all still love coupons. And the thing is, you can use them in any industry. And um, uh, it, it, it's just, it, it is actually worth money. It is, it is, it is actually worth some currency. Um, and I think coupons are great as well because on, with coupons, you can put your logos on coupons. Yep. Uh, you can put any marketing material on coupons and people will hang on to them and put them in their wallets and put them in their handbags because at some point they'll want to use it or they'll want to gift it. So the, it's a great marketing um, material as well. Yep. I used to, when I was marketing consulting going back, I don't know, 10 years, um, that, that's the type of stuff I would do. I would find complimentary businesses and, and do mm. gift card exchanges so that it made the purchase more valuable, just as you're describing. So it's, um, it's a nice business for like a bolt on activity to add to marketing consultants, SEO companies, agencies, like uh, the companies that watch this, uh, th this channel. Um, talk to me about, it's a nice transition into what you do these days. Talk to me about how someone becomes a joint venture broker. Mm -hmm. Well, a joint venture broker, you have, to, you have to first of all have, have some certain skills. One of the basic skills is uh, having great communication skills because it's your job to go and communicate uh, for not only your client, but with the joint venture partners or CEOs of companies that you're working with. Um, another thing to, uh, another skill that you've got to have as a joint venture broker is to understand how business works. Understand the dynamics and the foundation of how a business makes money. So when I'm always going out looking for new joint venture brokers to recruit or to train, those are the two big elements that I need. I don't need anything else, okay? Because I look for people that have a great personality that can uh, communicate well, um, uh, put their um, ideas uh, um, forward very, very well, and also have some grounding in, in a business knowledge. And also want to have the opportunity to go out and network with people and meet people. Now, one thing I always get told, okay, is, uh, hey, 
I'm a great networker. I network all the time. I put so many people together. They made so much money, but I didn't make anything. So it's just what it is, is you've got to tell people what you do. So if you're going to put people together as a joint venture broker or as, or as a connector or introducer, always tell people, this is what I do for a living. I put people together. I do deals. I do joint ventures. I do partnerships. That's how I get paid. Because then people understand that you're not doing it basically for free. You know, this is your livelihood. And I think you've got to put that across to people. Um, and in turn, people will understand that. And then it's just easier for you to communicate to people that look, this is what I do for a living. Got it. Um, talk to me about, um, talk to me about what someone could make as a joint venture bro broker on like on the low end of it, dealing with local businesses and then scaled up um, to some of the stuff that you do where, you know, you could make, you know, six figures, seven figures on a deal. So walk me through what that um, spectrum looks like. That's a great question. So one of the things you could do locally, for example, as a joint venture broker, is you can go out and reactivate um, uh, lost customers for, for companies and businesses and gyms, for example. And again, that's using the coupon method as well. You would go out and find JV partners who would be willing to give um, some offers. Um, and then that, that offer, you can package it and you can give it to the gyms that would give to their customers to get them to come back. And for that, for you, it would be recurring income. So that's one of the things that you can do. Another thing is we basically orchestrate the promotions. That's what we do. So we will go out and say to people, look, I've got a couple of people that are interested in partnering with you. Um, they're interested in uh, doing um, uh, co-partnerships, for example, and reciprocal partnerships. And my job basically as a joint venture broker is to put those deals together. So at the low level, uh, on a basic level locally, you can do a lot of deals in your own neighborhood, for example. And then we go to the next level where if you want to be a webinar broker, which is the same thing as a JV broker, but what you're doing is you're actually bringing traffic um, to people's webinars. And for that, you can make instant money. So for example, some of my students have decided to go down that route because it's quicker. And you know, I, I, I know a lot of people in, in the IM space. So uh, for that webinar, for example, they can make anywhere between $25,000 and $50,000 on one webinar, right? So that's how lucrative that is. Then on the other level that I do, I focus a lot on offline joint venture partnerships. Um, the sky's the limit. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you two examples. One is one of my students um, was involved in a solar power joint venture uh, in, um, that was basically a building that he got control of and he connected that with a, a solar power grid and they put a joint venture together and from that deal he made $3 million. It took him quite a while, 12 months to actually close that deal but he made $3 million with that deal. Um, I've done uh, the quickest, probably the, uh, the deal that I've done is, um, is a $1.5 million deal uh, within basically, uh, basically within 30 days. And that was uh, basically taking a book that I saw that had 400,000 customers. I, uh, I created a video course from that. And then I went back to the publisher. They upsold the video uh, to the people who bought the book. Uh, we sold 201,000 copies. My cut was $7.50 and I made $1.5 million from that, um, uh, that JV deal. Um, and then now what's happening, I'm, all, I'm also brokering some very big government deals. So, we're, you know, this thing about PPE, protective equipment and masks, I'm actually brokering a deal right now uh, that's worth $100 million. I'm brokering it with someone else and it's a, it's a governmental deal. So um, we'll see how that deal goes. Most of those high level deals, they happen and they don't happen. Um, also, something I've started doing recently is brokering luxury assets like um, watches. Um, I've been doing that for the last year with great success. And I also just uh, brokered, uh, if you saw my Facebook post last week, a, uh, a LaFerrari, which is uh, $2.5 million. Uh, and I'm actually brokering that deal uh, with uh, the sellers in Singapore and the buyers in Dubai. So uh, fingers crossed. If that deal goes through, that's going to make a fantastic case study. That's awesome. What would your, are you cool talking about what your cut on that would be or not? Talk? That's it. I signed an NDA on that, but it's, 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 it's very small on that because there's more margins in watches than there is in yep. cars. Cars, there's not many mar margins. There's not a huge margin in car, but that specific deal uh, I want to do as a case study so I can uh, present it uh, on my on my program and show people exactly look how you can do these deals without even being in that same place and doing it all online so that was pretty cool 
Got it. Okay. So um, a lot of our customers at ClickSkeek are, are SEO agencies, marketing consultants, uh, digital marketing companies, social media marketing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and their core business is local businesses. They, they market for local guys. Um, what can a, an agency or a consultant reasonably charge to set up a, a, a cross, um, you know, a cross, a cross referral alliance with gift cards between some businesses? Is it something where they're charging, you know, $150 for the relationship set up or they charge in $500? Give me an idea of what someone can reasonably charge at a local level for this stuff. It really depends. Most of the deals that we do are commission based. So our, yeah. the deals that I do, I would take a retainer up front. So my average retainer is like anywhere between ten and $15,000 to do joint ventures yeah. uh, to, or, to broker, or to broker a deal. But most of the deals that I've been involved in the space, even on a local level, are mostly commission based deals. Um, so, um, you know, we don't really, we don't tend because at that local level, it's, it's, it is a quite a small level to deal with. So uh, you're really looking for numbers. It's really going to be a numbers game. And also uh, on the referral side as well, in terms of uh, providing your JV partners with a, uh, and the kickback doesn't have to be a percentage. It could always be a dollar amount. So if your service is $500, for example, you could mm -hmm. always give the JV partner $50 or $100. So it doesn't always have to be a percentage. Some of the deals that I've done, um, uh, I've given the, you know, I've given the JV partner a, a kickback in terms of a, 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 of a dollar amount. So look, for every person that, that purchases this service or, or, or this product, we'll give you $50 or $100 for each one. So it's really just a matter of uh, um, uh, um, sitting down and working out what is the best way. Um, and most local businesses will be happy to, uh, to receive, um, you know, $100 uh, for each uh, a referral or for each, um, each sell, sell that they can produce or refer for on so um, that's more on the local level yeah but when i when i do them or when we refer people out and we get commissions back in i look at it as as just deferring overhead that's down our overhead each month it's a nice you know recurring income that comes it's good it's great yeah it's, and, it, and it covers all your exes so it's brilliant right so for for a local guy that's going to be doing gift card gift card so let's say we have a botox studio and a high-end italian restaurant and they each want to do 50 dollars coupons both ways um does the broker have a code on there uh, on the gift card so that once this gift card is submitted then they can uh, attribute it to that and that's how the broker gets paid out or is it without without a doubt two ways one is 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 a uh, code and the other is, is having a a box in that place where the cards go into so you can collect that but the codes are the most important you've got to make sure if it's an offline uh, deal involve, involving coupons then you've got to make sure that they're coded so you know exactly where they're coming from and you can track it. That is really the only way to track coupons um, unless they're digital coupons, but you know, there's, they're two different things altogether. Got it. Okay. Um, so how does someone actually become a JV broker? Like what, where do we, I, I know you, that's what you specialize in now. Is that correct? Yeah. Training? So, yeah. I mean, I, like? I've, I've been trained. Yeah. I've been training JV brokers now for the last 10 years. I started back in 2010. Um, and what I normally do is I normally do a, a three day boot camp in Las Vegas. I do that three or four times a year. And I've been doing that for the last 10 years, um, uh, without a doubt. But recently I've just, uh, created an online version of that boot camp, which is basically much more affordable, um, and, uh, much more easier for people to access because not everyone can fly to Vegas, even though people want to, it's a great destination. Um, but, and I limit my boot camps to, uh, you know, to eight people. I don't do more than eight because I want it to be more of a mastermind experience rather than just a lecture. Um, and I also provide all the students with deals as well. So uh, all my deals I share with students for 50-50 cut. And I also show them how to create their own deals also. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a program that I'm heavily involved in to make sure we get results. And we do. You know, if you look at some of the students that are coming out of these programs, some of them have done a five-figure, six-figure, seven-figure deals. Um, and it's, it's actually been a quite phenomenal watching the results. So that's awesome. Who, um, who would make a good joint venture program, uh, broker? Who, what kind of background do they have? Okay. So someone who's basically, um, motivated and driven someone who, uh, if you have already have a great network that always helps, 
if you have a good following on social media, for example, or if you have a great network, if you want to specialize in a niche, for example, and you want to say, look, I'm going to specialize in this niche and this is all I'm going to do. And I'm just going to create JVs for other suppliers in this, in this niche and be a broker and take a cut of every deal that comes through. So those are the sort of people that uh, will accelerate um, beyond a normal people coming into the program. Cool. Um, what else should people know about joint ventures? I think really because they should just go out and do it. A lot of people are fearful that, you know, where do I start? And the, the, the number one problem is a lot of people, they, they think, what if it goes wrong? Or um, what if it doesn't happen? Or what if I get cut out of a deal? You've got to stop doing that. You have to go out and actually do it. It, it, it is a numbers game and you've got to learn by repetition. So I think if you want to be really successful at joint ventures, you just got to basically go out there and take action, but also make sure that you have the adequate training and the support and the mentoring to help you along the journey. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, why reinvent the wheel when you can, you know, work with someone who's already done it and has been doing it for 15 years and um, it will just accelerate your, uh, your results uh, doing joint ventures. Got it. Okay. Um, where do people go to, to learn more? Is there a website they go to? Or is it a webinar? Or how do they learn more about what you do? Yeah, so I've got, a, I've got an online program. Uh, if you go to uh, um, uh, www.learn2, with the number two, broker.com. So that's my online program. It's, a, it's a, basically an eight-week program, um, a deep dive. Uh, it's basically my uh, three-day boot camp version online. And then uh, I also support all everybody in the program over 12 months by providing them with um, deals to work on also and providing them with um, even a white label version of my book. So the biggest lead gen for me has been the book. So every person that comes into, that, into this program gets a white label version of this book, which is co-branded with my name and their name as well. So they use that for lead gen and to get clients. So, you know, we've got some, so many resources. You get your own landing page as well as a JV broker to go and promote and collect and collect leads. So it's really just a, it's just a complete program um, it's like a business in a box, really, to be honest with you. Got it. Okay. Um, do you see this as a nice bolt on for, uh, for marketing agencies to offer this as a service to their clients? Without a doubt. I have a couple of students who are, who do this as an, as an ex external to what they already do in terms of, uh, I have some clients who do marketing consulting. I have some clients who do, um, software based products, for example, they do software consulting as well. And they add this as a bolt on to offer an additional service to what they already do. So yes, it's, it is ideal as a bolt on, uh, to, to make money from. That makes sense. Cool. All right. Down to the last four questions. What is the last book that you read? That's a great question. I think that the, the last book that I read was actually um, The Alchemist by uh, Paolo Coelho. That was the last book that I read. Very cool. What's your favorite book? My favorite book has got to be uh, Jay Abraham's Getting Everything You Can Out of All You've Got. It's a yep. book that I literally put under my pillow. It's the book that inspired me uh, 10 years ago to get into this space. And it's just an amazing book. And if you ever yep. get a chance to read it, definitely read it. Because this guy, I mean, he still is a phenomenal uh, marketing genius and I'm, I'm very um, blessed to call him my mentor. That's awesome. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? Brilliant question. So the best advice I ever got was from uh, Tony Robbins many, many years ago. Uh, I was very fortunate to, uh, I spoke on stage with his uh, son, Jarek, and I'm good friends with Jarek, and Jarek introduced me to Tony Robbins. And um, at that time, I was, I, was, I, I was doing a lot of speaking in the IM industry. I was speaking on some big stages, and I was looking at all these different avenues to go down, and, and what he said to me was, look, what are you good at? I said, I'm really good at connecting people, and you know, I, enjoy, I, enjoy, I enjoy doing the JV stuff. He said, look, here's what you need to do. Master one thing until you become number one in your industry and don't think about anything else until you become number one. And that's what I've been doing over the last 10, 15 years. And in terms of being uh, the JV expert or, the, or uh, the joint venture broker, I'd say I'm pretty much up there uh, in the, in the top 1%. So that's the biggest advice that I got. And that's all I do. If you go online, YouTube, social media, and you see what I do, I don't pitch or promote anything else for the last 15 years. This is all I've done. Joint ventures, and joint venture brokering and joint venture consulting. So, and it's really, really paid, you know, handsomely for me as well. So I, that's the advice that I got. That's awesome. All right. Last question. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? If you can go back in time and talk to yourself. You know what? The, the biggest advice I give to myself, the 20 year old self is drop your ego. 
you know, that's the biggest thing. I think when I was a lot younger, I was very, very successful. I lived in a 15 bedroom mansion. I had Ferraris and Porsches and Bentleys, but I had an ego the size of my mansion. And I'm really glad that I lost everything in 2008 and it allowed me to start from scratch again and be much more wiser. Um, you know, I always say to people nowadays that don't collect material things, uh, collect experiences, because those are the things that you will talk about with your children, your grandchildren, your friends. So don't get caught up too much into the hype with, um, uh, you know, um, making money so you can, you can buy fancy cars and fancy houses. It's good to have them and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, it's good to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you've been successful and, you, and, you, and you've achieved a lot in life, it's good to reward yourself. But there's more to life than that. And I've learned that over the years. But yeah, that's what I would say to my 20 year old self, drop the ego. I love it. Awesome. All right. Um, this has been a lot of fun today. Give me um, two things. Number one, mm. book. If you guys have not read this yet, go pick it up on Amazon. It's an excellent read. Uh, another joint venture book. I have them here. I love them both. They're two of my favorite books. Um, one more time, the website where people can go learn more about you. Yeah. So if you go to learn with the number two broker.com, learn to broker.com, that's where you can see my program. If you want to connect with me, go to facebook.com forward slash the JV guy and just type joint venture expert into Google or into LinkedIn and you'll find me um, if you want to contact me and, you know, just reach out to me if you've got any questions. Um, you know, I, I, I am available uh, and I'm always, uh, I always love talking to people and giving them advice and helping people. So, you know, one of my biggest mottos nowadays is give first, ask later. So uh, if you want any advice on getting into joint venture brokering, consulting, um, uh, uh, how to create joint ventures, then uh, number one, buy my book or number two, get on my program. And number three, uh, just reach out to me. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Let me just.